All right, it's just before 8 a.m. on March 2nd, 2022, the second day of the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch. I just pulled in, and I'm surprised at how much sunshine there is. It's supposed to be cloudy most of the day, so I'm going to get out and enjoy the sunshine while it lasts. I'm out here at the end of the boardwalk now, and it's just a beautiful morning. It's not too cold and not too windy yet, but later it will become cloudy and the wind will pick up. So I think later it'll feel much colder than it does now. Just a peaceful, quiet morning. There's a lot of ice fishermen out on the bay. And let me look through my scope and see what birds I can find. Hey everyone, this is David Brown with the summary for the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch for March 2nd, 2022. Well, the weather forecast ended up being completely wrong when it said that it would be cloudy and cold and windy because really the sun stayed out for most of the day. It only clouded over in the last few hours of the count and the winds never really picked up to be too strong. So that meant it was a great day for birding and a great day for getting photos. So let's go through the photos that I got today. While I was out at the end of the boardwalk, this flock of geese took off and came straight towards me. And at first I assumed that the smaller white goose mixed in must be a snow goose. But as it got closer, I could see that it did not have white wingtips. And so I think it's just an albino or near albino uh, Canada goose. Although it does look slightly smaller than the Canada geese that it was with. So uh, I'm going to share these photos around just to see what other people think. But for now, I'm going with it being a Canada goose. It doesn't seem quite small enough to be a snow goose. Someone else threw out the possibility of a greater white-fronted goose. Um, but so far this season, the only species of goose I've seen is Canada goose, and it was with a flock of Canada geese. So uh, I think that's the, the default option until proven otherwise. And here's one more photo of the goose by itself. And it was nice enough to fly right by me so that I could get some fantastic photos. I'm not sure if it's a true albino. It's hard to tell what the color of the eye is. I believe that albinos would actually have a pink eye. Um, so I'm not sure if this is a total lack of pigment or if this is some other uh, description, not albino. It even looks like in the wings there might be some amount of pigment that looks grayish. So we'll have to uh, put the photos out and see what some other people say. Tundra swans were continuing to migrate today. There were about 200 of them on the bay this morning, and then there were some more flocks that were migrating by and also dropping in. I can definitely say I'm no expert on galls, but I like to look at the flocks that are circling overhead and try to pick out the unusual ones. So I believe this is an Iceland gall. The first hawk of the day was this adult Cooper's hawk, which was acting a bit territorial, so I suspect he may be the local. And it was an interesting contrast because yesterday when I arrived, there were a couple bald eagles in a tree and there were harriers and there were rough legs and there were red tails flying around. Um, today, same time of day and everything, good conditions. And there were no raptors just hanging around, no raptors hunting the marsh. So really it took a few hours for things to get going today. And how do we know this is a Cooper's hawk and not a sharp shinned hawk? Well, it's holding the wings fairly straight. And it's got a fairly large head, although that's hard to judge, really. But the main thing to look at on a photo like this is you can see that the outer tail feathers are much shorter than the inner tail feathers. So you get these different steps of tail feather lengths, whereas on a sharp-shinned hawk, most of them, the tail feathers will all be approximately the same length. Now, there's some variability to that, but when you see it this pronounced, it's pretty much always a Cooper's hawk. Here's another gall that I called an Iceland gall, although this one was more distant and tough to get good photos of. After spending about an hour and a half on the boardwalk, I decided to go up to the Hawk Watch platform because I wasn't seeing anything new. And right as I turned around to walk off of the boardwalk, I saw this bird fly by and land on top of a small tree. And it turned out to be a northern shrike, which I knew to be on the lookout for because someone yesterday had mentioned that they had seen one in the park. But I was really happy to see this because my first season here at Braddock Bay, which was spring 2019, there was a shrike that hung around for like the first half of the season. So that was a lot of fun getting to see that every day. 
But then the past two years, there were no strikes. So I'm happy to get strike again on the list this year. Here's another gall that I called an Iceland gall, but someone told me that they think this might actually be a herring gall, that there are some herring gulls that have this pattern. And specifically, they mentioned the black on the outer feather here on P10, and with how dark it is and how uh, extensive it is, that this might actually be a special kind of herring gall. So this is another photo I might do some more research on. Here we have an immature bald eagle, and this is an older immature. It's getting pretty close to adopting its full adult plumage. Here we have a juvenile bald eagle, meaning it's in its first year. And this one, really, for a juvenile, has a lot of white. You can see all this white here. And we also see on the underside that this is very faded from the sun. But dark head, um, completely even trailing edge to the wing, so there's no... Um, there's no molt, and there are no feathers that have been replaced. The juvenile feathers on bald eagles are slightly longer than the feathers that replace them. So in second year and third year bald eagles, you get kind of a, a jagged trailing edge where you see um, the feathers that have been replaced are shorter than the remaining juvenile feathers. Here we have a light morph rough-legged hawk diving on a dark morph rough-legged hawk. Here's a look at the top side of the dark morph, and especially make note that dark morph rough legs do not have a white rump, whereas light morphs do, and can be um, a field mark that gets confused with uh, harrier, because northern harriers also have white in that area. And here is the light morph rough legged hawk, and this is a first year bird. We can see that because it doesn't have a bold trailing edge to the wing, just a very faint one. And also the tip of the tail is very faint. Um, adult females look kind of similar to this, but they would have that bold trailing edge to the wing and a bold tip to the tail. So this is a first year. And here's another look at the dark morph rough-legged hawk. And I believe this is an adult male because of how dark it is, as well as the multiple tail bands. Another nice surprise today was the first great blue heron of the season which I spotted coming from behind us, and then actually a red-tailed hawk dove at it, causing the great blue heron to let out a loud squawk. And then the heron turned and came pretty close to the platform, so I was able to get some pretty good photos, which I was happy about. Here we have an adult female northern harrier, and it's very similar to a photo that we took a look at yesterday. And again, just as a refresher, on the adult females, we have streaking on the upper breast and also they're more heavily marked in this patagial area and in a few slides we'll take a look at a comparison between an adult female and a juvenile northern harrier so we can learn from this photo which is a little higher quality and we can really see that streaking and the markings here on the adult female and we'll compare that to what it looks like on the juvenile we had a slow trickle of turkey vultures throughout the day for a total of nine and at the end of the video, we'll take a look at a hawk watch in Texas that's getting large numbers of turkey vultures right now. The peak turkey vulture migration time for us here at Braddock Bay is in about four weeks, right at the end of March, beginning of April. Here's another juvenile bald eagle, but this one is much less worn and faded than the one we took a look at earlier. Later in the season, we see what we call southern juvenile bald eagles, which are ones that were born over the winter down in the southeast United States and then migrate north and they're in completely fresh plumage and when I first saw this bird I thought that it might be one although this would be unusually early to see one but once I got the photos on the computer I could see that the underside is a bit faded from the sun and also the tail feathers are a little bit worn so this is probably a juvenile that was born last summer okay here's the comparison shot that I mentioned between adult female northern harrier on the left and juvenile northern harrier on the right. So again, on the adult female, even from this distance in quality, we can see that there is streaking on the underside and we can see those markings in the patagial area. On the juvenile, we see that it's much more plain underneath. And especially in the fall, 
they're usually more orange, but that fades throughout the winter. So by spring, they can look very plain underneath just like this. And they might have a tiny bit of streaking, but it's not this thick streaking that the females have. So just because you see a little bit of streaking, don't let that uh, sway your opinion. But you can see just all the way down here, this is all plain. And also here in the patagio area, completely plain. And I might even speculate that this juvenile is a male, just because it seemed significantly smaller than the adult female. Here's a bird we saw in yesterday's video. This is that juvenile red-tailed hawk that was missing a few feathers. And the one thing I just wanted to point out is that you want to be careful in spring migration, especially with buteos that are missing feathers. And you'll see this with things like red tails and broad wings. You don't want to confuse them for red-shouldered hawks. Red-shouldered hawks have a pale crescent in this area of the wing. And sometimes when other buteo species are missing feathers in the wings, it can be mistaken for that pale crescent. So just something to be aware of while these hawks are molting during spring migration. And the last photo for today, just a nice classic adult red-tailed hawk. I'll put a link to the eBird checklist from today in the description below, but you can see that we had 41 species today. And if we look at the hawk count report for today, we see that our migrant raptor totals were nine turkey vultures, three bald eagles, one red-tailed hawk, four rough-legged hawks, for a total of 17 migrants today. If we check on our rivals over at Derby Hill, we see that they had more than us. They had 47 total today, so migration is definitely starting to pick up in this area. And the counter today was Brandon Brogel, who some of you might recognize that name because he was the counter at the Wagoner's Gap Hawkwatch in Carlisle, Pennsylvania last fall. This is his first season as the counter at Derby Hill. So welcome and good luck this season. Try not to beat us too bad this year. And one final count that I want to point out. This is from Benson Rio Grande Valley State Park. Today they had 1,335 turkey vultures. So turkey vultures are definitely on the move down south. And like I said, it'll be another three or four weeks until we start to get the really big numbers up here. And if I jump back to the Braddock Bay report, let's take a look at the forecast for the next few days. So for tomorrow, which is Thursday, March 3rd, some lingering flurries, partly cloudy, high negative 5 Celsius, but winds northwest at 25 to 40 kilometers per hour. Those are strong winds from a direction that's not great for us, so I don't really expect it to be that good of a day. Friday, however, the forecast is looking better than it was originally. Now they're saying mix of sun and clouds with winds west-southwest at 15 to 25 kilometers per hour. So if that forecast holds... It's looking like Friday could be a good day, although it's still early in the season, so we don't expect our raptor totals to be huge, but compared to the surrounding days, it could be really good. For Saturday, we're looking at cloudy with mixed precipitation, winds east-southeast at 15 to 25. Really, the winds are going to shift to more east-northeast, so probably won't be a great day on Saturday. But keep an eye on Sunday. Sunday looks really interesting. It's supposed to get up into the 60s with very, very strong southwest winds and also some rain. So we'll have to see how that affects the hawk migration, but um, it'll definitely be an interesting day anytime we have those strong southerly winds. So Sunday's a good day to get out birding just to see what's migrating, and the hawk watch is a great place to be. Okay, that's all I have for today, but I want to tell one last joke, because when I was thinking about the gall identification, it reminded me of these videos, which if you've seen these videos before, post in the comments and let me know. There's these gall identification videos put out by John Dunn. He narrates them. And I probably haven't watched the videos in like five years, but I swear at random moments, phrases from those videos just pop into my head. Stuff like nominic lacoides. So let me know, does that happen to anyone else? I guess it's just one of those weird things that happens when you try to venture into gall identification. So I think I'll stick with hawks. All right, that's it for today. And I hope to see some of you out in the field in some of these upcoming days with good winds. This is David Brown. Thanks for watching. <laughs>